Hello, hello. This video is entitled The Fundamentals of Colon Cancer. My name is Edward Shipper. I'm one of the Surgical Education Fellows at the Goodman Surgical Education Center. And this video was prepared with the assistance of Dr. Jim Lau, a Staff General Surgeon at Stanford Hospital. You can follow us on Twitter at GSEC underscore surgery. Before we begin, let's review some goals and objectives. The goal of this video is to provide the learner with the basic knowledge needed to understand the diagnosis and management of colon cancer. After viewing this video, the learner should be able to identify the basic anatomy of the colon, describe the nomenclature used for the different operations of the colon, explain the pathophysiology of colon cancer, explain the rationale for screening for colon cancer, describe the staging of colon cancer, describe the preoperative assessment of colon cancer, describe the surgical management of colon cancer, and describe the postoperative assessment of colon cancer. The colon begins where the terminal ileum meets the cecum. The colon is described in terms of several sections, the ascending colon, the transverse colon, the descending colon, and the sigmoid colon. The colon ends when the three tinea coli extend circumferentially to form the outer longitudinal smooth muscle layer of the rectum. The ascending and descending colon both have attachments to the retroperitoneum. By contrast, the transverse colon and sigmoid colon do not have retroperitoneal attachments and can move freely within the abdomen. The junction of the ascending colon and transverse colon is known as the hepatic flexure. The junction of the transverse colon and descending colon is known as the splenic flexure. We won't show it here for long, but the greater omentum is a double layer of peritoneum that is attached to the anterior superior aspect of the transverse colon. Arterial blood is supplied to the colon by two midline branches off the aorta, the superior mesenteric artery, the SMA, and the inferior mesenteric artery, the IMA. In general, the venous drainage of the colon mirrors the arterial blood supply. We will not explicitly discuss the venous drainage of the colon in this video. Branches of the superior mesenteric artery include the iliocolic artery, which supplies blood to the terminal ileum and proximal ascending colon, the right colic artery, which supplies the ascending colon, and the middle colic artery, which supplies the transverse colon. The middle colic artery often contains a right and a left branch. Branches of the inferior mesenteric artery include the left colic artery, which supplies blood to the descending colon, the sigmoid arteries, which supply the sigmoid colon, and the superior rectal or superior hemorrhoidal artery, which supplies the proximal rectum. The terminal branches of all these arteries anastomose along the margin of the colon, creating an arcade known as the marginal artery of Drummond. All of the colonic branches of the superior mesenteric artery and the inferior mesenteric artery are cased within the mesentery, another fold of peritoneum that is tethered to the retroperitoneum. As an FYI, when describing the mesentery of the colon, the term mesocolon is sometimes used. The lymphatic system of the colon originates in the muscularis mucosa of the mucosal layer of the colon. In general, lymphatic drainage of the colon follows the blood supply of the colon. It should come as no surprise, then, that many draining lymph nodes of the colon are located in the colonic mesentery that houses the branches of the mesenteric vessels. As we will see, this arrangement has important implications for the conduct of colon cancer resections. Speaking of which, now is a good time to describe the nomenclature used to describe colon resections. As with the surgical resection of any organ, the accompanying blood supply must also be ligated for the operation to proceed in a hemostatic fashion. Ligating different combinations of the branches of the SMA and IMA and their venous counterparts will allow for different distributions of colon that can be removed. An ileocecectomy requires ligation of the iliocolic artery. As the name implies, a portion of distal ileum and cecum are removed. A right hemicolectomy requires ligation of the iliocolic artery, the right colic artery, and the right branch of the middle colic artery. With this resection, the length of the colon from the cecum to the proximal right-sided transverse colon is removed. An extended right hemicolectomy is similar to the right hemicolectomy, except in this operation, the middle colic artery is divided at its base, effectively ligating the right and left branches. This modification allows for a greater length of transverse colon to be resected. A transverse colectomy requires ligation of the middle colic artery, allowing for just the transverse colon to be resected. In practice, this operation is usually avoided because the subsequent reanastomosis requires mobilization of both the hepatic and the splenic flexures of the colon, 
and because this configuration of bowel results in a tenuous blood supply without any named artery directly supplying the region of the anastomosis. As you can imagine, both of these features place the anastomosis at a higher risk of leak, which is why the operation is rarely performed. A left hemicolectomy requires ligation of the left branch of the middle colic artery, the left colic artery, and the first sigmoid arteries. With this resection, the length of colon from distal left-sided transverse colon to the sigmoid colon is removed. An extended left hemicolectomy involves ligation of the entire middle colic artery, but is otherwise the same as a left hemicolectomy. This modification allows for a more proximal length of transverse colon to be resected. A sigmoidectomy requires ligation of the sigmoid arteries, allowing just the sigmoid colon to be removed. A total colectomy requires ligation of all mesenteric vessels, the iliocolic vessels, the right, middle, and left colic vessels, and the sigmoid vessels, allowing removal of the entire length of colon. A subtotal colectomy is similar, except the sigmoid vessels are preserved, allowing for all of the colon, except for the sigmoid colon, to be removed. Now that we know the basic anatomy of the colon, we can turn our attention to a discussion of colon cancer. In order to understand the diagnosis and management of colon cancer, however, we first need to learn a little bit about the pathophysiology of colon cancer. When we say colon cancer, we usually mean a cancer of the epithelial lining of the colon, adenocarcinoma specifically. Adenocarcinoma of the colon is the most common malignancy of the GI tract and the third most common malignancy among adults in the United States. Although there are other types of neoplasms that can be found in the colon, they are exceedingly rare, and we won't be discussing them in this video. As with all cancers, colon cancer is a genetic disease that involves activation mutations of proto-oncogenes and inactivation mutations of tumor suppressor genes. Initial mutations in cells of the colonic mucosa can lead to dysplasia, then adenoma formation, with subsequent mutations leading to carcinoma. This process has been studied extensively at a cellular level with several genes implicated in the pathogenesis. Germline mutations in any of these genes will predispose an individual to the formation of colon cancer and explain the higher risk of colon cancer and familial cancer syndromes. For instance, a germline mutation in the APC gene, which stands for adenomatous polyposis coli, is associated with familial adenomatous polyposis, or FAP. These rare familial syndromes involve different treatment principles of diagnosis and management and will not be discussed any further in this video. The vast majority of colon cancers are due to sporadic mutations in the colonic mucosa. These sporadic mutations result from chronic insults to the mucosa, which explain why things like age, smoking, and inflammatory bowel disease are risk factors for developing colon cancer. All further discussion in this video will pertain specifically to sporadic adenocarcinoma of the colon. Screening for disease refers to any evaluation to identify the presence of the disease before symptoms develop. Several features of sporadic colon cancer make this disease particularly amenable to screening. For one, the pathogenesis of colon cancer, from normal mucosa to dysplasia to adenoma to carcinoma, is slow. The whole process can take several years. This means that lesions can be identified before they turn into cancer. Secondly, the diagnosis and treatment of these precancerous lesions is associated with significantly lower morbidity and mortality than full-blown colon cancer. A small adenoma can be cured with removal at colonoscopy. At the very least, colon cancer will require an operation. There are several different modalities available to screen for colon cancer. To reiterate, colon cancer originates in the cells of the mucosa, so detection of the disease requires some way of evaluating the mucosa. Colonoscopy is considered the gold standard for colon cancer screening. This modality allows for direct visualization and histologic sampling of suspicious lesions along the entire length of the colon up to the cecum. Colonoscopy is also a therapeutic modality where polyps can be removed, a potentially curative intervention. Other modalities include flexible sigmoidoscopy, CT colonography, and fecal occult blood test, but neither of these options offer all the advantages of, of colonoscopy. Recommendations for the timing of screening for colon cancer are based on the natural history of colon cancer and patient risk factors. Different societies offer slightly different recommendations. The American Cancer Society, the United States Preventive Services Task Force, and the American College of Gastroenterology are some of the more well-known organizations. A discussion of the specifics of each protocol is beyond the scope of this video, but in general, for a patient with no risk factors, screening for men and women should begin with a colonoscopy at age 50 and repeated every 10 years thereafter. 
The presence of risk factors and or positive findings on a colonoscopy, such as polyps, will push the start time for screening colonoscopy to an earlier age and or increase the frequency of repeat screening. It is worth emphasizing that these recommendations apply to screening colonoscopies, which implies that the patient is asymptomatic. The presence of any suspicious symptoms for colon cancer, iron deficiency anemia, or narrow caliber stools, for instance, should prompt an order for an immediate diagnostic colonoscopy. Typically, once a histologic diagnosis of cancer has been established, the cancer must be staged. Staging serves to stratify patients by prognosis based on the extent of their disease, which in turn helps the treating physician determine the type and extent of treatment offered. As with many other cancers, the most common staging system used for colon cancer is the TNM system. T stands for tumor and describes the depth of invasion of the cancer within the bowel wall. N stands for node, as in lymph nodes, and describes the presence and extent to which the cancer has spread to the local draining lymph nodes. M stands for metastasis and describes the presence and extent of distant spread of the cancer to other organs or sites. The combination of T and M for a particular patient determines their stage of disease. Tables describing the specific criteria used to determine T and M status and stage can easily be found online. A discussion into the specifics of these criteria is beyond the scope of this video, but there are a few observations that bear mentioning. Stage 1 and 2 disease are localized to the bowel wall. Stage 3 disease involves regional spread to the draining lymph nodes. The presence of nodal disease in even a single lymph node immediately upstages a cancer to stage 3. As we will see, this has important implications on the adjuvant treatment of colon cancer. Stage 4 disease involves distant spread to other organs or sites. Stages 1 through 3 are indications for a surgical resection. Stage 4, except for select instances with isolated metastatic disease to the liver or lungs that could potentially be resected to downstage the cancer, is typically treated medically with chemotherapy. Colon cancer is different from many other cancers because the nodal status cannot really be assessed clinically. When we refer to clinical staging, we mean any staging that can be determined based on clinical exam or imaging. With colon cancer, positive lymph nodes won't necessarily be visualized with a CT scan. The only way to reliably assess the nodal status in colon cancer is pathologically. Pathologic staging refers to staging based on a surgical pathology specimen. So when a colon cancer is resected, in addition to the tumor, it is important to resect the draining lymph nodes as well so that they can be assessed by a pathologist for the presence of cancer. More on this in a bit. So if colon cancer can't be accurately staged until after a surgical resection, and cancer staging dictates treatment, is there any workup that needs to be done prior to the operation? If you guessed yes, you're right. Prior to staging, it is important to assess colon cancer in order to plan the operation and to guide post-operative management. The National Comprehensive Cancer Network, or NCCN, has published evidence-based guidelines to direct this assessment workup. By the way, the NCCN has similar guidelines for virtually all cancers in all organs, and I would encourage you to become familiar with this free online resource. The NCCN recommends the following workup for the preoperative assessment of colon cancer. Pathology review, in order to confirm the diagnosis of colon cancer histologically. Colonoscopy, in order to assess for synchronous lesions and to tattoo the lesions if necessary for intraoperative identification. CBC, to assess for anemia. Serum chemistry, including liver function tests, to assess for electrolyte abnormalities and possible metastatic involvement of the liver. CEA, or carcinoembryonic antigen. CEA is a cellular marker that is not specific to colon cancer, so it isn't the best test to diagnose colon cancer. But once the diagnosis has been established, a baseline level should be established to guide postoperative management. If the cancer is completely resected, CEA levels should normalize within four to six weeks. CEA levels that do not normalize postoperatively suggest an incomplete resection or recurrence of disease. A CT chest, abdomen, and pelvis is recommended to characterize the extent of disease. The liver and lungs are common sites of metastasis for colon cancer, and imaging can help identify lesions in these organs to help properly stage the cancer. Imaging of the abdomen can also help identify local advancement of the disease into adjacent structures, which should be resected and block along with the primary tumor. It is helpful to know about these findings prior to the operation, if at all possible. 
Once the cancer has been adequately assessed preoperatively, the surgeon can plan the operation. First, there are a few important preoperative considerations unique to colon surgery. Typically, surgeons will have the patient undergo a bowel prep prior to the operation. The goal of the bowel prep is to try and reduce the bacterial burden within the colon and thus reduce the incidence of postoperative infection. This can be achieved mechanically by giving the patient an agent to excrete the bacteria containing stool burden within the colon or with antibiotics to kill the bacteria within the stool. Bowel prep is a matter of controversy within the literature with different surgeons showing different preferences, but you should be familiar with these terms. Given the anatomic relationship of the colon to the ureters, the surgeon may also opt to have ureteral stents placed before the operation. Ureteral stents have not been shown to reduce the incidence of ureteral injury during colon surgery, but they have been shown to allow quicker identification of a ureteral injury if that does occur. Intraoperatively, the goals of surgery for colon cancer are to achieve complete removal of the primary tumor with tumor-free margins, complete removal of the lymph nodes associated with the vascular basin of the resected colon, and, if necessary, end block resection of any organs with local invasion. In general, tumor-free margins means a few centimeters of disease-free tissue on either side of the tumor. Just how many centimeters is a matter of debate within the literature. Some studies have shown that just two centimeters is adequate. A more conservative approach would be five centimeters. With regard to complete lymphadenectomy, remember that lymphatic drainage of the colon follows the blood supply, so the lymph nodes are located in the mesentery of the colon. As we have also learned, the presence of cancer within even one lymph node immediately upstages the cancer to stage 3. Therefore, it is imperative for the surgeon to remove as many, if not all, of the lymph nodes associated with the diseased colon to ensure accurate staging of disease. The NCCN recommends at least 12 lymph nodes be removed in a surgical specimen for colon cancer. In order to do this, the major vascular pedicle feeding the colon to be resected should be ligated proximately, close to its origin off of the major mesenteric vessels. A surgeon performing a right hemicolectomy for cancer, for instance, might choose to ligate the right colon near its origin off the aorta rather than closer to the tissue. This operative approach is implied when you hear the terms high ligation or a cancer operation in the context of colon surgery. Note that this approach is not necessary for benign diseases of the colon. A sigmoid colon resection performed for diverticulitis, for instance, does not require an extensive lymphadenectomy, and so the vascular pedicle does not necessarily have to be divided proximally. Once the cancer has been resected, it can be accurately staged. Staging will guide the necessity for any adjuvant treatment of colon cancer. Conveniently, the NCCN also provides guidelines to direct the adjuvant treatment of colon cancer. A discussion of the specifics of these recommendations is beyond the scope of this video, but in general, stage 1 and stage 2 colon cancer do not require adjuvant chemotherapy. Stage 3 disease, on the other hand, does require adjuvant chemotherapy. The standard adjuvant protocol for stage 3 disease is a combination of folinic acid, 5-FU and leucovorin, and oxaliplatin, also known as Folfox, given for 6 months after the patient recovers from surgery. As mentioned previously, stage 4 colon cancer typically would have been treated initially with chemotherapy without an operation and thus does not fall within the schema of adjuvant treatment. As an FYI, radiation therapy is not typically used as an adjuvant treatment modality of colon cancer because it is virtually impossible to target the colon without first affecting and injuring the overlying small bowel. The NCCN also provides recommendations for postoperative surveillance to detect recurrence of disease. Again, the specifics of these recommendations are beyond the scope of this video, but in general, they call for a series of history and physical exams, CEA measurements, colonoscopies, and CT imaging at various time intervals following the operation. Provided that no disease recurrence is detected, these intervals can be increased over time. All of these in interventions help to detect disease recurrence and direct the appropriate treatment as needed. And that concludes our discussion on the fundamentals of colon cancer.